Uh, now, some of our rarest and most elusive species are associated with decaying wood and aged bark. But how do we get to grips with understanding their needs and how do we conserve for them? So to answer some of these questions and to look at this in more detail, first, we've got Liam Olds, who's conservation officer at Bug Life. And he's going to be talking about uh, his title is In Pursuit of Rare Subprosonic Invertebrates. Sounds very exciting. And hopefully there's going to be a few beetles in here, Liam. Over to you, please, Liam. Oh, yeah. Apologies. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Liam's going to be talking, hopefully, about some of the things that he's been um, uh, finding recently uh, with various surveys that Bug Life have been doing at various sites throughout England. Great, thank you. Thanks very much, Ross. Just put a timer on my phone so I don't overrun. Um, so, yeah, so my name's uh, Liam Olds and I'm Conservation Officer at Bug Life. And I'm just going to talk to you about uh, saprozoic invertebrates and the survey work we've been doing. Um, as part of the Ancients of the Future project for uh, this special group um, of invertebrates. Um, so as we mentioned by my colleagues, um, saprozoic invertebrates are a species that are dependent upon dead or decaying wood uh, at some stage of their life cycle, uh, or they're also dependent upon wood inhabiting fungi or other saprozoic organisms. And they're a diverse group within the UK, so around 2,000 invertebrate species are dependent upon dead or decaying wood in one form or another during their life cycle. And this also includes some of our rarest and most threatened invertebrates um, in the UK and some of our most spectacular species as well. And as part of the Ancients of the Future project, we've had 12 um, primary target species. These are largely beetles, uh, particularly click beetles, and probably, probably the best known perhaps of our target species is the spectacular violet click beetle, which is um, known from just a few sites in the UK, uh, one of which is, is Winter Park. Uh, which is yeah beautiful looking thing um, and we also have um, a few different flies on there as well so the royal sprint uh, uh, crane fly which um, has been touched on by by jamie um, and also the western wood vase hover fly uh, which has also been mentioned in previous talks as well and as well as the sort of primary target species the rarest of the rare that we really want to survey for um, and do management work for there's also um, a whole sort of suite of secondary species as well and these um, sort of saprozoic invertebrates have presented a number of different challenges and Jamie touched on these um, earlier and I'm just going to go into a bit more detail with these. But these saprozoic um, invertebrates are, tend to be very elusive, so there tend to be very, very few records um, in the UK of them. They're difficult to identify, which means you often need um, experts involved and it's really difficult to sort of train um, sort of volunteers to go out and survey for them because they are that difficult and, and need a microscope and really sort of specialist knowledge. They tend to be very few known sites for these species. Uh, some of them are restricted to single sites. Uh, some of them, um, such as the, the Royal Splinter crane fly, is not known from only two sites in the world, uh, one of which is winter. Um, and they also have very um, precise ecological requirements as well, very, very niche habitats. Uh, and all these sort of factors combine really to sort of result in quite complex um, survey challenges that sort of require really technical surveys and they require leading experts in those groups. Uh, another sort of big challenge really with doing a project on saprozoic habitats and invertebrates is the fact that veteran trees don't work to not sort of um, to sort of such short timescales. So they require much longer uh, timescales. So we're not really gonna see any sort of measurable change um, in such a short uh, four-year project. Um, regular monitoring is also not really possible unlike some of the other Back from the Brink projects um, because the species is so elusive, because it's so difficult to identify, uh, so rarely seen. Um, and that's where perhaps monitoring sort of the key features, those dead wood features, um, such as the number of rock holes or the number of sort of um, veteran trees and that sort of thing might be more of a better sort of substitute than actually sort of surveying for all those actual individual species. Um, and our project, because of these challenges, have really kind of focused more on the sort of assessments of the habitat condition, of the habitat continuity, um, and also getting that baseline um, invertebrate data, because invertebrates tend to be very sort of under-recorded, so we know relatively little about them, so even on some of these key sites. We've been kind of getting out onto these key sites and where we think that there's potential for primary species to be, to get out and survey in, not just for them, but also for the wide range of other saprozoic invertebrates as well. 
Uh, one of the sort of um, sort of target um, species uh, that we've done um, surveys for this year has been the mocker beetles. Um, so this is a, an endangered red data book one species that's legally protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, in the UK, it's known only from Mockers Park, uh, which has uh, been touched on earlier, uh, which is a, an ancient deer park uh, that's home to lots of rarities. And with a lot of these saprocytic invertebrates, we know very little about the larval stages, particularly the larval stages, because they're often hidden away, maybe in underground roots or within cavities in trees and that sort of thing. And we also know relatively little about the adults in many cases as well. And that's the same with the, the mockers beetle. But we believe that they inhabit the red rotted interior of ancient oak trees um, and they use in um, burrows and galleries that are made by other saprozylic invertebrates then um, and then feeding on other small invertebrates such as mites um, and calembla, which are the springtails. And so, yes, yeah, so we've been doing um, targeted uh, surveys for, for this species, which is one of our uh, primary species as part of the project. Uh, and surveys were done between 2018 and 2020, and really with the aim of trying to understand the species distribution um, at Marcus Park and to obtain that kind of baseline data really about the trees um, on which the beetle is found. And, and the adults are usually find, found by beating the foliage of thin branches and twigs. Uh, that are near to um, uh, rock holes or cavities. And surveys were done in 2018 and 2019 by, by John uh, Kuta, who's um, an expert on the Mockers Beetle and uh, very familiar with Mockers Park as well. Uh, and together with those surveys and all his sort of 40 odd years of uh, survey experience at this site, we managed to confirm the presence of Mockers Beetle um, on 16 uh, veteran oak trees. And there were some surveys done uh, that Alice touched on as well earlier um, uh, last year, um, which was partly hampered by uh, COVID, so we could only do uh, two days of surveys. But um, John, who's um, up on a cherry picker there, um, and he's sort of up in the tree, and it sort of allowed us really to to survey for the species sort of um, above the normal sort of um, arms length that, that uh, John would normally be restricted to. Um, and that proved um, quite successful in finding quite a few uh, females. So recorded 26 females, um, including 19 on a single tree. But unfortunately, the, the season was really progressed because of the warm weather and uh, we missed the, the males, uh, unfortunately. And another species that we've done targeted uh, surveys on is the Western wood vase hoverfly, which is a critically endangered species that's also found at Mockers Park um, and a single site then uh, in the Forest of Dean. And this developed in water-filled rock holes in those ancient beech trees, but also other trees like horse chestnut. Um, and again, this has been touched on earlier, but a survey was done um, by Andy Godfrey in 2019 that unfortunately only found sort of four, four females. So we're sort of, well, much lower than um, previous surveys. So a little bit concerned there and obviously we need a lot more work um, done on this species to find out how they're really uh, faring at this site. Uh, but the survey was successful in finding a lot of other rare, um, rare and scarce saprocytic invertebrates um, as well. So that was just a little bit of like a run through about some of the targeted uh, species surveys we've done. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we've done um, largely sort of surveys um, just trying to get that baseline data really to sort of find out what what saprocytic invertebrates are found um, on some of these uh, key sites. Uh, and one of the sites um, that we surveyed uh, is um, Pet Petworth Deer Farm, uh, which is in West Sussex. Uh, um, a survey was done last year by Mark Telfer, who um, I'm sure many of you know, is uh, basically a legend when it comes to um, Coleoptera and beetles. Um, and he really focused on the beetles there as a key indicator of saprocytic habitats. And many of these saprocytic invertebrates, as I mentioned previously, are hard to find um, and really you do kind of need an experienced entomologist that's Mark kind of going out and survey for them and employing a different wide variety of different survey techniques uh, to account for all those different species. Um, and Mark has used all of the sort of standard methods that most entomologists would use, so uh, sort of sieving leaf litter, sweep netting underneath the trees, beating the trees, um, just directly observing things that might be on the bark uh, and that sort of thing. But then he's also um, deployed some more specialist sort of techniques that you might use for saprocytic invertebrates. Uh, one of those has been the use of vein traps or aerial interception traps. So some of you might have seen these before, uh, but you sort of hang these up uh, within the canopy of trees, or in this case, over a fallen um, dead oak tree. Uh, and what it does is you've got these perspex sheets 
um, any sort of saprozylic beetles um, that are flying through the canopy and flying above the dead wood. They hit the perspex, they drop down through the funnel, um, and then they collect then in uh, a little sort of jar of um, ethanol and they get preserved in there. Um, and these traps are left up for about a week or two. And then the entomologist comes along, collects them, um, and then can microscope and, and ID the contents. So as well as um, this, which is used as a sort of typical uh, standard technique for, for looking at saprozylic beetles, he also in, sort of uh, deployed some sort of rather unique um, sort of methods. And I'm sure many of you are probably getting drawn towards the image on the right, which is uh, an auto capture, which is um, something that most entomologists in Britain don't use, uh, a bit more common on the continent. But this is literally just um, attaching a, a net to, to your car. Uh, and Mark was um, driving around Petworth Park and you're just catching things as you're driving along uh, and actually it's supposed to be a good technique for finding um, a lot of species that you don't normally find when you're out on foot. Uh, so that was quite good and you can just um, get out of the car and attach the, uh, the net and then li literally just put it out or, or collect any, anything that looks of interest and you want to uh, take back to microscope. Uh, on the left there uh, is another uh, technique that uh, Mark used um, at Petworth Park, which is, um, is a, a subterranean pitfall trap. So you bury these into the ground, anything that's moving through the soil. So if you've got saprozylic fruit, it might be associated with decaying underground roots. Um, they're sort of moving through the soil and all the uh, dead wood material. Um, and then they sort of go through the mesh and then they fall down into um, a jar of ethanol again and then they're preserved and you can collect them and identify them at a later date. So, so some really quite interesting survey techniques um, that was deployed by, by Mark. And this uh, survey proved uh, really successful. So Mark found 366 species um, of which 234 were beetles and uh, 56 of these species, so around 15% sort of or so, are regarded as key species sort of endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, all of those species that are sort of really vulnerable uh, to extinction. Um, and with um, sort of when you're doing these saprozylic um, invertebrate surveys, um, each uh, species has a scoring system. So depending on upon how um, strongly associated they are with particular deadwood habitats, they'll score a value. And the higher the value, uh, the more strongly associated they are with saprozylic habitats. Um, so when you combine all the species from, um, from Mark survey together with all the other uh, species that were already on the site list, um, effectively Park with, uh, Petworth Park comes up with um, a site quality index value, SQI value of um, 569.2, which is the 27th highest um, SQI value um, in Britain. So that's, that's really good. Obviously shows us a really um, quality site for saprozylic invertebrates in, in Britain. Um, and it's also the third highest in Sussex. And also these species have an, an IEC value, which is an index of ecological continuity. So this is a value really about how strongly associated they are um, with sort of unchanged habitats where there's been this continuity of old trees for a long period. So some species will be heavily reliant on really old trees that are perhaps really heavily decayed. So they are really reliant upon um, old sites that have always had these um, trees present on site and others might not be. Um, but when you sort of add up again all of the values from, from the species, you get um, uh, one of these IEC values of 87, which is the, the 17th highest British IEC value. So, so that's another really excellent outcome um, and the highest uh, of any Sussex site. So this really proves then you've got these high quality deadwood habitats that have been present from ancient times to the present. So really suggesting a site of international importance. And also um, Petworth Deer Park, um, as a result of all of this, we know that it's unquestionably a site of national importance for invertebrates. Um, and it could well be regarded as a site of international importance as well for its saprocytic invertebrates. So some really good outcomes uh, from this survey. And one of the perhaps more exciting highlights really was finding the false click beetle, which is pictured here. Um, which this was actually the, only the fifth British individual that's ever been found of this species. So really, really endangered, really rare species. So really exciting to see that. Um, and Mark also had some other quite interesting looking species and I could be here all day sort of picking out interesting looking uh, beetles. Uh, but this particular one is an endangered species. as a species of rogue beetle, a staphylinid. And it was previously known only from the sort of mid ten sort of region. And it lives within the decaying heartwood of veteran oak trees. Um, associated with brown tree ant, which is Lysias brunius. 
Um, and this was found in one of those subterranean uh, pitfall traps, uh, which I pictured here. So you can see where Marx had set up um, is a subterranean trap into the base of this sort of uh, broken um, oak tree. And this was the first record for Sussex and also the first record kind of away from that mid Thames region. So, so you've had some really, really exciting finds as part of this survey. And just one other one, um, perhaps less rare than the others, but this is um, a species of lined flat bark beetle. Um, and this is nationally scarce. Uh, it occurs in quite widely across Southern England, but it's very rarely encountered. It's flattened because it lives under the bark and it lives under the bark of beech trees, um, but also a few other trees as well, such as oaks and, and hornbeam. And this was found in those aerial interception traps. So those traps that um, are held up in the, in the canopy and that sort of stuff. Uh, but this particular one was in the flight interception trap held over a fallen um, oak, oak stump. So that's just a, a bit of a run through some of the species. And just to say with all of our surveys, then management recommendations would be given to the landowners. So in this case, uh, Mark's recommendations were to keep the existing trees um, and shrubs as we kind of want trees to grow um, naturally and age naturally and die naturally. Uh, so minimal intervention to these trees that have these deadwood features is really important. Uh, but kind of important things that Mark highlighted was to bring about the end of timber and firewood removal on the site, which is obviously damaging to saprocytic invertebrates to do um, tree planting to ensure we've got that continuity of habitat going forward into the future. So we ensure we've got our ancients for the future and also to designate the site as a triple SI as well, because it's uh, not currently, but it's clearly worthy of it because it is a site of national, or potentially international importance. Um, so that's me done. So thank you very much for that, bit of a run through. And uh, hopefully that was useful. For the um, surveys that have been going on lately. Um, now we're going to move on to um, a different group of organisms. We're going to be looking at uh, wood rotting fungi. So Chris Knowles is going to be talking about the wood rotting fungi of Great Windsor Park. Chris is a consultant mycologist and ecologist. So uh, we've got 15 minutes now uh, for Chris's talk. We've had a bit of a technical hitch. So Chris is up next and then hopefully Dave Lammercraft will, Lammercraft will be after Chris. So Chris, if you'd like to take the stage, please. Hi, so yeah, I'm glad to get an opportunity to talk about this um, Back from the Brink project um, about the distribution and diversity of wood rotting fungi in um, Windsor Great Park. Um, I've been listening very keenly to all of the other habitat and species work done over the last couple of days, but uh, fungi haven't been mentioned quite enough, so I'm not going to talk about anything else for the next 15 minutes. So um, the long-standing royal protections of Great Windsor Park have helped maintain a reasonable continuity of ancient trees in a wood pasture and parkland habitat setting that's quite rare in the UK. This currently means that Windsor Great Park is one of the few UK sites that boasts large numbers of standing dead and fallen veteran trees. The great diversity of wood rotting or saprophytic species supported at Windsor critically relies on the continuity of large volume living and dead wood resources, standing and fallen trees in various states of decay providing a wide range of niches for different species and the successive stages of their life cycles. This project took the form of a death study investigating all the known records of non lichenized fungi found in Windsor Great Park over the last 50 years. Those fungus records were then compared with other habitat data to map the geographical, um, host and habitat based hotspots with all fungus species of conservation importance and those with legal protections, um, they were all identified and species whose ecology relied on mature trees and deadwood were all classified separately to be the main focus of the study. And then finally, management and future monitoring recommendations were made in relation to those findings. So how we did it, uh, Windsor Great Park had been cut historically divided into 21 biological recording compartments and this project used those compartments for all the mapping and reporting. However, the first step for this death study was to find the data. Um, apart from gaining access to the national databases, it was also important to track down all those things in filing cabinets and notebooks by speaking to local recording groups and other individuals um, who we approached to source any relevant records all of which were then collated into one single database. In the UK, there are two national databases of fungi, the FRDBI, which is maintained by the British Mycological Society, 
and Kate 2, which is uh, maintained by the Fungus Conservation Trust. And both organisations agreed to share their data with the project. In the end, this resulted in over 33,000 records that were selected as being potentially relevant to the project. However, we couldn't just run a simple um, filter that would separate um, all of the ones that we needed out by grid reference or uh, location name like Windsor, because at least 10,000 of those records had no grid reference whatsoever. And we're using things like localized place names, um, so uh, such as Cranbourne Chase or Crooks Hill and Snow Hill. They were often used, but not always with the same format or spelling. Um, the locations of these records were checked manually um, by the names of the locations and the features, often having to refer to older maps like this for names that don't appear on current OS maps. Um, a further 7,000 records had a very broad grid needed to be gone through manually by location names for relevance. Uh, once we filtered that through, the list was then checked for valid species names, um, correcting the many spelling mistakes along the way and cleaning out all duplicate entries. So after coarsely filtering the data in this way, the data set consisted of just over 6,000 records made up of uh, 1,330 species and 582 genera. By comparison, um, a similar study that was made in 1999, 1999 described around 1,200 species having been found at that time. So we're in the same sort of ballpark. Um, this process data set was then compared against the list of threatened, protected and priority species at national and international levels. Um, fungal taxonomy though has been going through periods of considerable change over the last 50 years. So to ensure that no species records were missed out during the process, we added up to two recent synonyms to each species and then com the comparison filter also checked those for inclusion. The taxonomy of each record was also checked at this point with all taxonomy that already matched the current names given in the Natural History Museum's UK Species Index were left unchanged. However, where records only had older names present, these were updated to current preferred names. And then a secondary data set was created featuring only those species which corresponded with this list of priority species and red lists. After this, at every point another filter was applied or uh, the database was adjusted in any way, care was taken to identify any of these priority species that might be omitted and notes of those omissions were included in the results. So in the wider data set, 65% um, of all the records had very poor grid references, making it impossible to successfully map those records correctly. This in turn made it difficult to exactly match individual records to individual records to the compartments and habitats on the site. This issue was not as pronounced with the priority fungi records though, presumably because recorders were more likely to make a special effort to get accurate grid references when they found those. The kingdom of fungi is taxonomically huge. So um, for the purpose of this study, all the records were divided into nine loose categories. The categories were divided along a blend of genealogical, ecological and morphological lines. And therefore the lines between them could be quite blurred. So a consistent method of applying categorization to each species was done. And the category were um, going from uh, top left, Basidiomycete saprophytes, that's generally shrooms and bracket fungi like in that photo, um, are those fungi species on wood. Ascomycete saprophytes is, uh, uh, tend to be much smaller fungi on wood, as little more than dark spots or dots. Um, and then in the top right, resupinate saprophytes, it's a category which captures a diverse number of fungi with similar crust-like growth forms on wood. And then on the next row, um, Ascomycete others is just a huge group of fungi that are generally not typically mushroom shaped ones. Uh, the Basidiomycete other, uh, conversely, is the category that includes pretty much all of your classic mushroom shaped fungi. Rusts are fungi only associated with the soft parts of the plants. Smuts um, that utilize the redu reproductive parts of the plants, particularly grasses. Microfungi is things like moles. And the myceets, not true fungi themselves, but records of those cymoles are included in the fungus databases. 
So in actuality, only the first three of these categories were relevant to this study. But as none of the, uh, that's because none of the other species um, or groups have the same reliance on dead wood or on mature and ancient trees as a substrate. However, because these databases have now been created, we were asked to um, map them and assess them as well, which I'll come back to later. So the distribution. As previously mentioned, 46% of the records in the data set were unmappable. Um, this issue was biased towards only a few genera, um, and apart from the red-listed and priority species, was apparent across the whole set of data, so it was equally balanced throughout. That meant it was still possible to get a reasonable view of fungal hotspots by looking at geographical concentrations of records. Unfortunately, you can see here the map on the left shows the locations of fungus records and um, how they can be skewed by the use of uh, the lower resolution four digit grid references and centralized grid references. So you get a, a concentration of hotspots on the points where the grid meets and at the center of the grid squares. Um, so on the right, um, we managed to work with only the higher resolution grid references and the non-centralized grid references uh, us to map distribution to some extent, density of the fungal records within each given one kilometer grid square, which we could then compare against, to some extent, against the compartments um, in that area. So using only the records that allowed for the more precise mapping, um, it was possible to show also host and substrate availabilities um, and how that was a major factor in either species distribution or the recording bias of people targeting those areas. Um, so using those lists again of the, the priority species, um, fungi of uh, Windsor Great Park were checked and filtered to provide the following results. Um, to assess which tree species supported the greatest number of target fungi species, um, we put together a list of all the substrates and associated organisms that had been recorded across the 6,000 um, records, which came up with 50 woody plants and trees. Um, however, only 37 of these were host to any of the priority species and red lists. You can see on the wee table to the right there um, that uh, this, what it came up was uh, unsurprisingly, Fagus and Quercus stood out as being the most important ancient trees, Windsor Great Park's red listed and priority species of uh, wood rotting fungi. Um, it is also note that the third highest number is um, on that chart there over at the right was the number of records that had no detail about associated organisms. So again, it's this disparity in the, the data that we could use. Um, however, the, the accuracy of grid references was generally better for these priority species. It was still necessary to only create maps, including records at a one kilometer square resolution that could include a good proportion of the priority species. Of the 59 priority fungus species that occur at Brent Windsor Great Park, 10 species either had no records with a grid reference or only 10k square grid references. So um, putting those limiting factors aside though, uh, there were still clear hotspots in the distribution you can see on the map here, where that's where the priority, the priority fungi um, are, it doesn't match the earlier maps of the fungi data set. Um, so in some areas here, that had very few um, of the overall um, records of fungi are quite hot spots for priority ones here. And conversely, some areas um, that are hot spots had no, little or no of the other fungi. Other parts of the same studies um, were compared to the distribution of the uh, surveys that have been done of veteran trees over 400 years old also against percentages of dead wood found in each compartment. However, no clear statistical correlation could be made through that. Um, but the top 10 compartments that had priority fungi in them also were the, uh, mostly the same top 10 for dead wood availability at the park and also the same top 10 for trees. So they all overlapped consistently, um, making up the majority of each combined top 10. So uh, we did look beyond just the, the wood rotting fungi. Um, just 
briefly cover that that uh, um, we at, um, the JNCC um, triple SI selection guidelines and applied them in villages of fungi that we had for uh, tooth fungi associated with the oak, beech, and sweet chestnut. And uh, they surpassed the threshold there, suggesting that that assemblage within the park is of um, triple SI quality. Similarly, for beech deadwood species um, and oak deadwood species. Um, more of note, perhaps, is uh, the grassland fungi. There, several of the categories of grassland fungi had high numbers of species diversity, but not all of them, which suggests that further field work and surveys of the grasslands could be recommended. Um, the bottom is not uh, an assessment included in the current guidelines. However, there is a draft available for assessing that assemblage. Um, and Windsor Great Park looked great in, in that. Um, Number species um, were recorded, so in many ways far surpassing uh, that assessment. Um, however, one of the factors of assessing them is how many of those um, species were found within the last 10 years. So, uh, and the priority species within that assemblage, uh, only six, so below the threshold, have been found within the last 10 years. Again, suggesting though, the ongoing monitoring of the areas where those species are found and that those species in particular uh, would be recommended. So, uh, to generally start concluding that, Windsor Great Park is host to a wide diversity of fungi and priority and protected species, some of which were restricted to a very few locations. Uh, the large number of records of those species was in part due to the historical continuity of relevant habitats there, but it's also due to concerted efforts are made by many mycologists over many, many years. Um, although the park had a comparably high quantity of fungal records, many of those were actually of poor quality, giving really little of the additional information that would be needed to assess them or to map them in greater detail. Uh, in total, though, um, this death study found 1,330 species of fungi from 582 genera that were recorded in the park over the last 50 years. Of those, 59 were priority and or red listed species and 446 species were of the target wood rotting fungi. As you can see in the weed chart here, um, capturing uh, some of the fungi that ha appeared on the most number, or the greatest number of red lists and the three of those, the, the top ones that are pictured. This all reconfirms the importance of uh, Windsor Great Park for the death study stage um, of assessments um, and uh, looking at sort of triple SI quality assemblages um, uh, suggests in it all that uh, it would be advisable to compare current management policies uh, with those that benefit the specific needs and habitat requirements of the four assemblages listed here. And I'll go into some of that just now. Um, uh, further monitoring, for example, as I keep mentioning, the records for the fungi in Great Windsor Park betray a number of biases um, as to habitats that were uh, examined um, and surveyed, and a lack of detail common to many fungi records across the whole of the UK. Um, in particular, um, the lack of quality grid references and notes on associated hosts. Um, can be vital for correcting uh, misidentification, resolving taxonomic changes and the like when this sort of survey, this kind of study has been done. So I put forward a, a suggestion that for all future surveys, um, an absolute baseline for those uh, surveys and monitoring uh, for professional and just local amateur recorders uh, should be um, that all their hard-worn records should have a minimum of a six-digit grid reference um, for all recorded finds and an eight or ten digit, digit sorry, grid reference uh, minimum for uh, species that are targeted for monitoring. Also, the associated organism or host should be recorded for all finds. Okay, um, and uh, Essentially, all the red listed and priority species should be resurveyed to get up to date and exact grid references and it will make future monitoring of those species more practical. Um, to round upon uh, 
management recommendations. Essentially, um, maintaining veteran trees in the wooden parkland would rely on low levels. However, baseline surveys of the quantity and distribution um, and quality of veteran trees, alive and dead, um, as well as large pieces of deadwood should be conducted. Um, maintaining a supply of deadwood may be vital to the populations. So um, naturally occurring damage and death will provide enough resources and habitat, so long as the sites themselves aren't allowed to shrink in size and that um, the range of trees of different ages are available to become recruited as the new veteran specimens through beneficial management of the surrounding habitats and uh, potential veteranization methods. And um, where possible, things like paths being rerouted away from those trees, they don't need to be felled for health and safety reasons in the future. Um, okay, and just to acknowledge all those that helped with the project are the funders and supporters. That was me, thanks. Many thanks, Chris. Uh, excellent talk. Um, fungi, the diversity of fungi is absolutely mind blowing. Um, I wish I knew more about them, but you know, there's uh, so many fascinating organisms out there and so little time. So now we're going to hand over to um, Dave Lammercraft, who's the lower plants champion at Plant Life. Uh, Dave's going to be talking to us about um, can we transplant the rare pox lichen from one tree to another? So, Dave, uh, take the stage, please. Um, um, sorry, due to technical issues, um, you're not getting any slides. So um, you've just got me talking at you for uh, what might be 10 minutes, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, so I work for Plant Life as a lichen and bryophyte specialist. Um, I'm going to talk to you about this trial work we've been doing, trying to transplant this uh, pot lichen, perennial initata, at Vernon Beaches. Um, this is work we've done through the Ages of the Future project, and uh, I've been working on it with Neil Sanderson consultant lichenologist that lots of you will know. Um, and uh, so my first slide, if you can imagine, is a beaver and a white-tailed eagle. So um, lots of, you know, our translocations, we're kind of used to translocations these days as reintroductions. So beaver, white-tailed eagle. I also had a slide of very pretty ladybird spider and lady slipper. Um, so ladybird spider, lady slipper, beaver, white-tailed eagle are all translocations, but they, they're kind of the reintroduction side of translocation. Um, so that's that's basically just taking populations uh, back into places where from uh, their former ranges where they've been lost. So with lichens, a lot of what we do tends to be it doesn't really fit um, quite as well um, into those kind of traditional um, definitions of translocation. It tends to often be sort of rescue attempts. So um, things like the barrier pulmonary, the tree lungworts. Um, We've done quite a bit of work over the last few years transplanting that where, say, um, a large ash tree on one site was very rich, covered in lichens, that came down in a storm. Um, so we took that opportunity to transplant some of the lungwort from that tree to another part of the site, a part of the site where um, we lost a lot of the lichens due to dense rhododendron infestation. So um, that was kind of both a rescue attempt, rescuing the material on the ash tree, but also uh, a reinforcement um, slash small scale reintroduction to a part of the site that um, uh, where it had been lost due to the rhododendron. Um, uh, we've also done some work on um, a very rare lichen um, called Briorea smithii, uh, one of the horsehair lichens. Uh, the entire British population of this lichen would probably fit onto the side of um, an A4 sheet of paper. Uh, it's only known on two sites in Dartmoor. And uh, I was doing some monitoring work on this um, a couple of years ago and found a really good clump of it on a dead branch. And it was a good chance to both try the translocation of this thing, which hadn't really been done before from tree to tree. Um, and also to save that, you know, what would have been an eighth of a side of A4, you know, an eighth of the British population, um, try and save that chunk of lichen by transplanting it onto uh, another part of the tree. So they tend to be kind of rescue attempts. Um, with the leafy lichens like the Liberia, um, they're, they're relatively straightforward to transplant um, and relatively successful. Slugs are probably the main problem, actually. Um, okay, so that's a bit about translocations and lichens. So we're talking about Burnham Beaches. Burnham Beaches, I'm sure many of you will know, um, it sits just to the west of London between Slough and Beaconsfield. Um, 
I was <laughs> going to show you a, a lovely old engraving from the 19th century of uh, Burnham Beaches in the Victorian era, um, which shows back in the mid 1800s, um, this beautiful wood pasture kind of structure with these amazing old beach pollards. Um, and I've also got a photo of Burnham Beaches taken about two years ago and it looks almost identical. Um, there's still um, still lots of beach pollards, ancient beach pollards and this, this lovely wood pasture structure as well, which um, is being restored and, and managed by the City of London. So the site's an NNR, it's owned and managed by the City of London Corporation. And they're doing a fantastic job of restoring this wood pasture landscape. Um, so perennial nitida, it's one of 10 species of perennula found in Britain. Um, it's, uh, it's a crusty, crusto species. So, you know, it basically grows immersed in the bark cells. So quite different to things like the berry pulmonaria where it's, you know, leafy and it sits on the outside of the tree. Um, this grows immersed in amongst the bark cells. Um, so it presents different challenges when it comes to transplanting. Um, it has a very thick, waxy kind of phallus, the body of the lichen, and then I think the name pot lichen comes from these little black dots that um, are over the surface of it, which are the fruiting bodies, which are ejecting the spores. Um, it's a southern beach specialist, so it's um, very much uh, a lichen of, of southeast England, but it's only known from two sites now. Uh, Burnham Beach is one, and New Forest is the other. Relatively widespread, I guess, in the New Forest. Um, but very rare, uh, more of a continental species, I guess, really, but it occupies the kind of native beechwood range in Britain. At Burnham Beaches, it's known, was known until we started working there in 2019 from just one tree, a, a massive old beech pollard, very spectacular tree, but sadly, um, sadly it's dead and um, being held up by uh, straps, where it's strapped to adjacent trees. And the City of London uh, approached us to to ask if we could help with, you know, help sort out this lichen, transplant it somewhere else. Um, it had actually been tried in 2001 by William Purvis um, and several fragments of bark were glued onto um, uh, other trees nearby. And these fragments of bark have actually survived. Um, so they're still present now. 20 years later. Um, but interestingly, they, they haven't really done anything. So the, the fragments, the bark fragments are still there. The lichens are still there on the bark fragments, but they've not, the lichens haven't got off of that bark fragment onto, um, onto the bark of the tree. Um, and there's also no signs of the lichen colonizing elsewhere on the tree. So it's kind of not obviously worked in some sense, but um, I think the reasons for that being that the, the bark fragments are glued on top of the bark. So they sit proud of the bark of the, the receptor tree. And also they weren't really put into the right niche uh, for the lichen. Um, so the idea that we had was um, basically wanting to try and perform a bark graft uh, in the same way you would do with, um, you know, uh, fruit trees or whatever. Um, so I was trying to think of ways in which we could do this. Um, Someone uh, was working on this with April Windle, who some of you will have come across, uh, just trying out these various techniques. And we were thinking about using grafting wax to kind of seal seal a fragment in place, but someone pointed out that squirrels would probably love to eat um, grafting wax, so we ditched that idea. Um, and the, the, my favorite idea was to try and take a plug, like a, a little plug out of the donor tree with the lichen on and, and make a similar size plug hole in the receptor tree. And uh, we tried that with an increment borer, um, which I think actually worked really well for trees that have fairly thin bark, um, fairly dense wood, a compact kind of plug that you get out of the out of the tree with that. But with old trees, like our, our big old dead pollard, uh, beech pollard at Burnham Beaches, the the it just doesn't work. It just kind of crumbles into dust basically. So. Um, I resorted to the age old technique of using araldite to glue stuff uh, in place. And it's a fairly straightforward process really of taking a fragment of the lichen from the um, donor tree, a uh, healthy piece of lichen. We were taking pieces about the size of a 50 pence piece. Um, 
And then cutting, well, identifying the niche to where to transplant the, the lichen into is pretty important, as I said just now. So we were looking for trees with um, rain tracks, so where water's, rain water is kind of flushing down the trunk, um, or wound tracks, so where you get water coming out of um, wounds in the tree, and where the tree was obviously um, less acidic, more base rich. So we were using indicator species like orthotrichum mosses and the liverwort Metzgeria fecata and lichens like Entrographicrassa and Parina species to kind of give us a clue as to the right kind of niche to put them into. And then it's a case of just uh, digging out a little recess in the receptor tree that's the same size and shape as your fragment you've taken from the donor tree and gluing it in place. Um, so I did have some nice photos to show you how that kind of worked. Um, so we did this in twenty in March 2019, and I went back in May of this year to see how they were doing. Um, and some of them had taken really well. So that idea that we were working to where we we're trying to get the, the fragment to sit into the bark so it's flush with the, the bark on the trunk of the tree in a kind of natural position, that, that we do seem to have actually achieved that in a couple of cases anyway. Um, uh, so we also took the opportunity to move some Bellicidia in Compton. We found some of that on the, the ancient pollard. This is another rain track and wound track specialist that likes more base rich bark, a former elm specialist that um, is quite dependent on ash at the moment. So it seemed quite important to try and transplant this to see if that would work. Um, requires has similar habitats to the perennula, but a slightly different niche in that it likes um, rain traps and wind traps that haven't yet been colonized by anything. So these these little niches get colonized quite quickly by various lichens like the Entographa and perennula species and perina species. But the Bella Cydia and Compton needs to get in before those species. It doesn't quite compete. It's got a much thinner sort of body to the lichen. Uh, it was quite hard to find the right niche for the Bella Cydia, um, because most of them were most of these traps were colonized already. Uh, but we tried a few of those. Um, so in terms of measuring success, um, I think one level of success is, is that you still have your fragments present. So the fact that we've got, um, I think it's 31 out of the 33 that we did two years ago are still there. Quite a few of the ones done by William Purvis in 2001 are still there. Um, so that's, you know, that's a good level of success. Uh, the next level up would be um, has it spread, has the transplanted lichen spread off of its original bark flake onto somewhere else on the tree? Um, and then the next level up would be, has it done that? And then is it kind of colonizing elsewhere on the tree? And then is it colonizing other trees in the vicinity? Um, and I think uh, there's one example where, I mean, it's early days, it's slightly hard to tell, but I think we might actually be seeing the movement of one of the Bellicidia transplants off of its original flake onto the bark of the receptor tree already. Um, interestingly, the Bellicidia transplants have decomposed quite quickly, um, whereas the perennial ones haven't. Uh, I think this might be related to the different uh, characteristics of the thallus, the body of the lichen. So the thick waxy thallus of the perennial probably protects the bark to some extent, whereas the Bellicidia has a very thin thallus that probably doesn't. Um, so, you know, I was pretty encouraged by what I saw back in May, both in terms of the survival, the way they were kind of looking nice and flush into the um, bark of the tree and with this Bellicidia possibly having spread off as well. That, that was great. Um, so what have we learned? We've learned that um, mixing two-part aerodite in the field is really messy. <laughs> Um, it gets everywhere. Uh, I've got it all over my fingers, all over the trees, all over my notebook, all over my phone, all over the lichens. So it's a bit of a, uh, a bit messy. So I think uh, using aquarium glue would be a good option in the future. Uh, they come in, you can use it with little silicon guns, so a bit more accurate and you don't have to mix it up and all that kind of stuff. So, and it's quite inert. Um, it's early days, obviously, with these ones that we did two years ago, but, um, you know, some of these species of lichens are, you know, they're adapted to colonizing quite quickly. So, you know, I think we might already be seeing the spread of the Bellicidia. Um, the survival of the transplanted flakes seems pretty good for the perennial especially. Um, identifying the niche is, is probably 
the most important thing. Um, and that is quite hard with lichens because there's relatively little research in terms of their ecology. So we're kind of just, um, you kind of have to interpret what you're seeing in the field basically to try and work out where they kind of might want to, when they want, when, when they want to be transplanted to. So, um, and then lastly, I think, you know, you can't overlook the fact that the, the habitat and the habitat management needs to be right, needs to be good for long-term survival of these lichens and their communities. So um, it's not just a case of, you know, we can just pick a lichen from over here and dump it over here and it's all, it'll all be fine. The, the management is, is all really. Um, and that's something that, um, so at, at Burnham Beach is actually after, after we did some of the transplants, um, the City of London also did some management to um, open up the, the, uh, the light conditions in the wood and make the, the conditions, you know, particularly suitable for the perennial. So can't overlook the importance of habitat management. Um, and that was about me coming to an end. Um, I need to say a big thank you to Neil Sanderson uh, for his help and to the City of London at Burnham Beaches who do a fantastic job of managing Burnham Beaches and uh, are very interested in their lichens, which is great. Um, and I was finishing on a picture of a beaver and a picture of perennial nitida, uh, just to show you how much more cute the perennial nitida is than the beaver. But you'll have to kind of imagine that bit. Um, so there we go, that's, that's me. Many thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks for that. And thanks for persevering through those uh, technical difficulties. Um, we'll be sharing Dave's presentation, um, so his slides, after the conference. So keep an eye out for notification of that. Um, now, if I ask everyone to return onto the stage with me, we'll have a Q&A session. So if you've not already used the live Q&A, a function at the bottom of your screen, use it now if you've got any really pressing questions you want to ask any of the presenters in this last session. Um, I've got a few to begin with, um, actually for Liam. Um, now, Liam, I, with, I know you, you mentioned things like the, the violet click beetle. Um, I remember a long time ago, there was a theory that it had an association with uh, birds' nests in, in cavities in old beech trees. Is that, was that ever found out to be true or not? I think, yeah, I, I do think, well, as far as I'm aware anyway, that it does seem to require um sort of wood mold so it's, it tends to be the last thing that colonizes a tree effectively that's why they're so rare they need these really old trees that are hollowed out in the inside then by by fungi and then the contents really basically of all of that broken down sort of decay material then has got a compost and then they sort of sort of within that then feeding on i believe other invertebrates and that sort of thing but it seems to be some sort of requirement that they need um, yeah, sort of bird feces um, as part of their um, life cycle as well. And I think that's where uh, the stuff that uh, Steph Skip is doing uh, at the moment with um, creating those artificial uh, boxes and then they're using, you know, chicken manure uh, as basically a substitute for that. So it's still, I'm not sure if it's fully, you know, confirmed, but that's, that's a theory anyway. And it's just, as with most things, you just got to keep trying different things and it takes a long time to find these things out. Mm. And is there anything known about, obviously, the trees that they go for, some of these real specialists, what is known in terms of, you know, the tree being in full sun, if it's standing, if it's uh, the humidity levels in the wood? I mean, you know, there's so much to try and figure out there, isn't there? Yeah, it's really complex. Yeah, and I think as Jamie sort of touched on earlier, this, you know, you can have, yeah, dead wood in so many different conditions, you know, yeah, full sun, full shade, high up, low down, wet, dry, you know it's it's so varied and i think working out you've got to be a bit of a detective really to try to work out the exact requirements of um a lot of these species and yeah it, it can take a lifetime of a very dedicated entomologist to try to figure these things out you know yeah i think that people don't really realize that you know you can devote you know um decades even whole careers to try and figure out the, the lives of even one species some of these things are so complicated and there are so many different things going on yeah and of course you've got the different larval stages and they might have different requirements from adults to larvae and that's what makes um vertebral conservation so complex and it's um part of the fun of it i suppose as well yeah no, it yeah. is yeah you know? Because, you know there's just so much to learn isn't there still um 
Liam, I'll come back to you in a second. There's a few more questions coming in. Uh, Dave, a question for you. Um, now, do you think lichen translocation should be done more widely, e.g. as a way to restore populations to areas where they've been lost in the way that we're doing uh, with uh, things like red kites and white-tailed eagles and beavers, etc.? Um, I think it's a tricky one. I think it, there's, there's a temptation there to think it's an easy way to get these populations back. Um, I think there's lots that we don't know about lichen ecology and how how their, their genetics and their sexual reproduction works and stuff like that so i think there are questions around just the whole way that lichens kind of work but having said that i think there is yeah we should be looking perhaps at thinking about sort of landscape scale restoration um of lichen communities so it, you know it has been discussed with people at edinburgh you know, um, edinburgh botanic gardens example you know the idea of having a big project to reinstate populations of the various species say that have been lost so um i think there is an argument for it um i think by and large though you know the key thing really is to get the management right you know i, I don't think the translocation is necessarily a quick win that okay. makes sense yeah yeah okay um and there's also a, que a question for chris uh, chris with with your surveys, you've been looking primarily at fruiting bodies. That is, that's correct, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was a death study. So yes, it's records of fruiting bodies. And how how would you try and sort of extrapolate from that to you know because bearing in mind that you know often the the high fear under the ground are very cryptic. How can we sort of um, how can we extrapolate from the distribution of those fruiting bodies to where? actually these things might be distributed through the landscape because they're going to be much more widespread aren't they or not uh well no so for the particular species that we're looking at or we were focusing on on this study uh no you know you you really are uh, limited to sort of real veteran large pieces of dead wood or, um oak and fagus so you can limit that down to only the places where those trees are um, for a lot of other wood rotting, you know, I mentioned that we've several hundred wood rotting species that we identified and a lot of those don't need the tree, uh, the volume of wood or the age of the wood uh, or even those particular species. Um, and the, there is people, um, there's been some success on grassland fungi using eDNA sampling, which would potentially then allow you to go into dead wood and just take a wee sample and then go and get it sequenced and get a whole list of species that are there, um, which would answer uh, you know, your, your query there. But there is issues around loads and loads of the species that you might get there are cryptic species that you don't get fruit bodies from. So for as many as identify a bit of wood that has a fungus on it that would normally fruit that hasn't been spotted because no nobody was there on the right day to see the fruit body before the slugs got it you're going to find dozens more species that there's potentially no sequence in any gene bank and a lot of new and tiny micro fungi so yeah still the best method tends to be field work going out and and looking for those fruit bodies and, and, and how fuzzy is the taxonomy of, of the fungi you've been looking at? I mean, you know, because reading some things, I mean, obviously with, with insects that I'm, you know, I'm aware of, uh, taxonomy is of, often quite fuzzy, but then fungi seem to be a whole another level of, of fuzziness in terms of what we deem to be one particular species is actually much more diffuse and complicated than that. Is, is that? Yes, a lot of species complicate, complexes. Um, yeah, so that, that's coming up all in the whole of fungal taxonomy is um, in a state of constant flux, I think, um, you know, ha has been for some decades now, but with the advance in sequencing and stuff, it's really changing the game. Um, and it's, you can just, somebody can discover that what we believed was a single species might be half a dozen species, but it doesn't really mean anything unless you can match that to morphological or um, micro characters that you can actually say, well, this is where the line is between the species and that. So, um, but yes. and will, will you be able to use things like, you know, the, the handheld sequences like the mini iron and things? Do you reckon you'll be able to use things like that in the field in the future or not? Um, it seems to be the way that uh, everything is going. It, we're just at the moment 
Um, I just don't think there is enough um, eDNA sequences in the banks to cover all of the, uh, either there isn't enough or they're not all reliable, the ones that are out there at the moment. So there's, there's just too many unknowns for it to be efficient, but I'm sure that, you know, we'll get them all eventually and yeah, it'll become more and more relevant. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thanks very much to, uh, to, to all three of you for some uh, fascinating talks.